Welcome to the Moneyball Clinic. I took the top 30 leagues, simulated them in full detail, then smashed it all together to create an aggregated database. This will be the baseline, from which I'll be taking a look at a different team each episode, analysing their squad, creating a simple tactic and using performance data to suggest practical transfer targets. Today, we'll be looking at the biggest underperformers in the Premier League, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Wolves had the biggest gap between their media predicted finish of 11th and their aggregated league position of 16th. In fact, they only met expectations on one occasion, and Gary O'Neill was given his marching orders 50% of the time. He's doing a great job in real life, but this is not real life, and sadly virtual Gary O'Neill just isn't up to the task. It's not hard to see where the problem lies. Wolves scored the fifth fewest, conceded the fifth most, and finished, overall, fifth bottom. To set things right, we'll turn to a veritable Molyneux legend, Steve Ball. Yeesh. Right, let's start by taking a look at the squad. Despite their goal-scoring woes, this is a team with attacking talent. Pedro Neto, Pablo Sarabia and Matthias Cunha are all exciting players who can turn a game in an instant, and we should be looking to maximise their talents. I've loaded up the save which is closest to Wolves' average performance, so we can take a closer look at their output. Pedro Neto was used on the right wing and was a very dribbly boy. Seven goal contributions in 38 appearances, however, is rather disappointing, and his poor XG underperformance suggests he might not be the most appropriate player to be the volume shooter that he was. Pablo Sarabia was far more productive. Playing primarily behind the striker in a 4-2-3-1, he finished as the team's top scorer. And whilst he's in the 60th percentile for expected assists, I would have expected him to be more creative. His effectiveness in winning back possession is a pleasant surprise. Matthias Cunha was deployed as a striker, and this might speak a lot to Wolves' goal-scoring troubles. As a pressing forward, he was very good at the defensive stuff, but a goal every four games is not the kind of return you're looking for. It feels like all three players have been underutilised by virtual Gary O'Neill, and if we can address that, we'll go a long way to improving this team. So who were the supporting characters? We know they played a 4-2-3-1, although we don't know the roles. These were the players who started the most games. Jose Sarr was perfectly fine. His low average rating was a byproduct of a leaky defence, but his 0.18 XG prevented is a good sign that he did a pretty good job of keeping the score down. In defence, Nelson Semedo was progressive, both in terms of passes and carries, but didn't contribute much to the defensive side of the game. Dawson was okay. He didn't engage in a high number of tackles or aerial challenges, but when he did, he won them and was very safe in possession. He is a little slow though. Kilman was more engaged, but with lower success rates. Johnny seems to be the weak link here, under the 50th percentile in almost all metrics. He did split time with Ryan Nori, who had fewer expected assists, but performed better in almost everything else. In midfield, João Gomes proved to be effective in the possession game, winning the ball, keeping it safe, and progressing through passes and carries. His partner in crime, Tommy Doyle, has returned to Man City after his loan, and that means we've lost his pizza chart, although a quick look at his headline stats shows he didn't pull up any trees. Mario Lamina did not play enough minutes to draw any real conclusions. The left wing spot was filled by Huang He Chan, and he was a bit rubbish. An okay contribution on the defensive side, but little to no impact in attacking areas. Sasha Kalajic was the only other player to play significant minutes. For someone who is six foot seven, that's six foot seven, he won less than half of his aerial duels. He was more prolific than Matches Cunha, though, and that is something we should consider when making our plans. All in all, this is a reasonably balanced group with a healthy mix of established stars and emerging talent. 
there is perhaps a lack of important players in central midfield, but otherwise this looks like a solid squad to work with. Now, one of the hoops of the series is to be able to provide you with something useful if you are about to start up a save with one of these teams. Based on what we've looked at, I'm going to suggest the tactical approach that I think will suit Wolves and the players at their disposal. This is only meant as a base, a simple starting point from which you'd be able to then build further. I'll be simulating through with my suggested transfers at the end of this video, but anything suggested here can be improved by making adjustments to what you see in game. With that out the way, let's reveal the tactic. 4, 4, 2. I promise simple and you don't get much simpler than a 4, 4, 2. Let Neto run at players from the left, have Sarabia cutting inside and creating from the right, and put Cunha up top where he can pester and harass. Kalajic can be the foil to all three, with Semedo getting forward to be the fifth man. We're playing wide, passing into space and running at the opposition. In transition we'll counter press, because I always counter press. It's the best time to win back the ball and we have bodies forwards. It just makes sense. We'll also look to counter. I'm putting faith in those dribbly boys to wreak havoc when running at their man, even if the numbers are not to our advantage. If they bypass our counter press, we drop into a low block. We'll be compact and narrow, hoping to draw the opposition onto us, so we have space to counter when we get the ball back. Player instructions are equally simple. The right back stays wide and dribbles more. The inverted winger sits narrower and takes more risks. The double pivot tackles harder. There's a lot to fix with this Wolves team, and rather than trying to address everything at once, I'm focusing on improving goal scoring output. And the way to do that is to find ways to get the ball to our best players. I expect we'll concede a lot of goals, possibly even more than they did under virtual Gary O'Neill. It should at least be fun. With the tactic set, we turn our eyes to the transfer market. Now Moneyball means different things to different people, but for the sake of this series I will be working under the assertion that, in its simplest form, Moneyball is the use of data to identify players who are undervalued by the market. I will also be looking for players who can make an immediate impact on the first team. That means any players we sign must be purchased for less than the market value and for lower wages than the player they will replace in the starting 11. With a modest two and a half million pound budget and 50,000 pounds per week spare for wages, we'll definitely stay within that criteria. Realistically, we won't be able to address multiple positions, and so our focus will be on a midfielder to play alongside Zhao Gomez. I have created a pizza chart to show the average performance of Zhao Gomez across all simulations, and we can see that he is a capable jack-of-all-trades midfielder, with the exception of scoring goals. 0.9 dribbles per 90 might not sound all too impressive, but for a defensive midfielder that's an encouraging sign that he can be a progressive carrier. He is a little careless in possession though, in the 50th percentile for possession lost and I'm keen to find someone who will be a little safer to partner him in midfield. I've been back to my mega spreadsheet to search for players with a better tackle success rate, pass completion and turnover differential than our young Brazilian. A lot of the results will not be viable, either far beyond our budget not interested in joining or playing at too low a level. I have, however, narrowed it down to three options. Salah Uchan is a deep-lying playmaker currently playing in Turkey with Besiktas. Six foot tall, Uchan is a sturdy defensive presence, winning 47% of his aerial duels and 78% of his tackles. His 5.11 progressive passes and 0.18 expected assists per 90 is impressive given he receives the ball less frequently than other candidates. At 29, he has experience that could be valuable to this team, but struggles in Serie A earlier in his career might be cause for concern. On the other end of the spectrum, 20-year-old Vicente Pizarro fulfills the South American Wonder Kid requirement of any FM shortlist. He is not technically a Wonder Kid, but he is young, Chilean and a model professional. A left-footed tempo setter Pizarro averaged 0.3 expected assists per 90 
and registered the highest turnover differential, which is possession loss subtracted from possession won. These stats were taken from saves where he moved to a top 30 league, so we know he can perform at a higher level than where he is currently. He is, however, lacking in defensive contribution. Registering in the bottom 5th percentile for headers and 25th percentile for tackles, there were real concerns about whether he would be able to contribute as part of a two-man pairing. My recommendation, however, is Emil Brevik, a spirited 23-year-old ball-winning midfielder currently playing for Molde in Norway. His output is comparable to that of Uchan, 0.19 expected assists, 4.87 progressive passes, and 2.09 tackles won per 90, albeit against lower quality opposition. He does, however, have a better tackle win rate, header win rate, and pass completion, and his traits are better suited to a more vertical playstyle. He's also more familiar than the other candidates with performing that water carrier role, which would free up Zhao Gomez, or perhaps even Mario Lamina, to undertake the box-to-box -box role within our tactic. He's going to cost us 5.5 million, with 4.5 million of that spread across the next three years. That's well below Zhao Gomez's £31 million valuation, and he arrives for less than half his wages. The proof, of course, is in the pudding. So let's pop him in the lineup, go on holiday, and see how things shake out. I do need to mention here that I'm only putting players in the lineup that I need to. Ideally, I want to avoid setting too many players as the game will then play them when they are not at full fitness. Brevik is set here for obvious reasons, and ain't Nori because I have no confidence the assistant manager will pick him over Johnny. I think we can call that a success. We surpassed Wolves' best league performance in the baseline tests, shattering their points tally by 25% and finishing in the top half. Just. We even managed to finish with a positive goal difference. But it's not fair to judge on a single simulation. Injuries, morale and luck all play a significant part in how a season pans out, and so it's only fair that we run this a few more times to see if we've actually improved the team, or just got lucky. 10th, 9th, 13th, 12th and 9th. Safe to say we're onto something here. My favourite season might be the one where we conceded 94 goals and finished with minus 36 goal difference, yet still managed the same points tally as virtual Gary O'Neill's best season. We lost 5-3 at West Ham before beating them 6-4 later in the season. I promised it would be fun. But how did Brevik get on? We signed him to fulfil the more defensive role in our midfield, and that he certainly did. His defensive output was generally higher than it was in baseline simulations, and that came at the cost of his offensive performance. It is also worth pointing out that our tactical approach was more direct than Gary O'Neill, and so we had less of the ball, finishing in the bottom five for average possession in each save. Nine goals and 29 assists is a pleasant surprise given his role, averaging seven goal contributions per save. When we signed him, his value held around what we bought him for, but by the end of the season this has tripled. This, of course, has as much to do with spending a full season in such a high-profile league, but I think it can be considered an indicator that he was originally undervalued. More importantly, however, it meant we didn't have to start Tommy Doyle. Zhao Gomez's defensive performances improved, as did his goal contributions, and that provided the platform but our improved team attacking output. Pedro Neto's overall impact may not have been as good as I wanted, but his average 10 goal contributions per save is a considerable improvement on the 7 under Gary O'Neill. Playing in a deeper position than baseline, Pablo Sarabia sacrificed goals for assists, but an average of 15 goal contributions is more than sufficient. This all set up Matthias Cunha to take the headlines. In the baseline, he scored seven and set up one playing as a lone striker. But with our changes, he averaged 13 goals and four assists, more than doubling his overall output. If we'd made reinforcements in January, I believe we could have pushed for European qualification in at least one of the saves. Not that one. 
and if I was to continue now, I'd be turning my attention towards defensive improvements. But I'll save that focus for another Moneyball clinic. Until next time.